think it's interesting on a day that we think about ghosts and goblins, we celebrate the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? That is good news, and we are glad that you are here to worship with us this morning. I do have a few announcements to bring your way. Uh, if you did not grab a bulletin when you came in this morning, we do have bulletins available there on the welcome desk um, out in the foyer there. There's a little basket where they are at if you want to grab one of those just so you can see the things that are going on at our church and just know a little bit more about us. You are more than happy to grab one of those bulletins, and within the bulletin, uh, you will find a care card in there. We feel that card is really important for a couple of reasons. One, if you would like the church office to have any of your contact information, or if any of your information has changed, if you moved or have a new email address or something like that, we would encourage you to put that information uh, on that care card. Uh, and then there are two baskets in the back of the sanctuary there that you could place that care card there. Uh, but the most important, most important part of that care card is the bottom, is there's a place for a prayer request. If there's anything that you would like just the elder team to be praying for, or if there's something that you would like the whole church uh, to be praying for, we would encourage you to take the time to fill out that card um, and know that we'll pray for those things. We just don't say this every week uh, just to say that. We say it because we mean it. Uh, we uh, do want to know how we can be praying for you because we just want to care for you in that way. So feel free to fill out those prayer requests and put those in place. Uh, the Harvest Festival is coming. We encourage you to mark your calendars for uh, November the 14th here. Just a couple of weeks away, uh, the Harvest Festival is, is almost upon us. And that will be Sunday night. Uh, the door is going to open at 5, and then the event will, the meal will start at 5.30. It's going to be at the Heartland Country Barn, and it's just a wonderful time. If you don't know what the Harvest Festival is, I, if I could put it in a nutshell, it's basically a time where we gather together, we enjoy a, a great meal uh, together. It, it's free. Uh, you don't have to pay for the meal. And then we just share around the table and with one another just how God has been faithful, uh, just how we are just thankful for the things that God has done for us over the past year. Uh, we're going to have several testimonies uh, that are going to be shared as well at the Harvest Festival. There's going to be time of worship. And then we do take up an offering every year at the Harvest Festival as well. And that goes to just see how we can be a blessing uh, to those around us and how we can minister to those around us. So those are the elements of the Harvest Festival. And we would love to have you come and join us. So you can sign up in a couple ways. One, if you get our church emails uh, this, this past week, there is a link that you can go online and you can register for the Harvest Festival in that way, or you can do it the old-fashioned way. There are sign-up sheets um, on the welcome desk out there that you can sign up. Child care will be provided for those nine and under, so if you need child care for little ones, uh, you can sign up for that as well, and then we would just love to have you come and be a part of the Harvest uh, Festival. And then finally, we have uh, Veterans Day is coming up. Veterans Day is uh, November uh, 11th, and so next Sunday uh, is we want to honor our veterans. So if you want to come dressed in uniform, that would be awesome. We would love to just be able to recognize you, so just know that that is something that is coming up quickly. It's next Sunday, so we'd love to have you be a part of that. Our scripture reading today is going to be from Psalm chapter 2. Uh, this is a psalm that points to Jesus. Uh, lots of psalms do that. And this is one of those. And in our passage today in Acts chapter 4, it uh, talks about Jesus. And there's a connection here with Psalm uh, chapter 2. And just really shows us how the Bible's one big story is interweaving everything uh, and is all pointing to Jesus. And so we would, what we want to do is use this passage to help prepare our hearts to worship and praise the Lord. So if you could stand with me in honor of reading God's word. This is Psalm chapter 2. Why do the nations rage? Why do the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Who sits in the heavens and laughs? The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have sent my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. 
Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice in trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quick and kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Let's pray. Father God, as we read this psalm, we see several things here. We do see that you are ruler and reigning over all things. And you have set up your Son, which we know is Jesus Christ, who reigns and rules over all nations, over all governments, over all kings, and over all authorities and powers. And there is a warning in this passage that says, if we do not follow you, there is judgment coming. And we need to heed that warning. But I'm thankful to see that within this psalm, it is not just warning of judgment, but there is also a blessing to say, blessed are those who take refuge in him. So I pray that we would hear that word and then that we would see the blessing that we come to you, that we don't go our own way and that we don't do our own thing, but that we come to you and that we run to you and that we see Jesus as not only the authority of the universe and the world, but also the authority of our lives too. And to see the good thing that is. And that we would come now and that we would worship you and praise you for your greatness. That we know that Jesus has come for the purpose of bringing us near to God. To take that wrath, that this wrath that is going to go on people in judgment, this wrath is what Jesus took on our behalf so that we could be with you. And so we thank you for that. We thank you that we will not be on the receiving end of that wrath because Jesus received that wrath on our behalf. And so that now we may be brought into fellowship with God. And so now I pray that you would help us worship you and to praise you for that wonderful gift that we have been given in Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Would you please remain standing as we worship the Lord this morning. We won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side, you will go before us, you will lead the way, we have found a refuge, only you can save, sing with joy now, our God is for us, the Father's love.
Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to read one of these verses here in verse 9. It says, As I looked, the thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was, uh, his throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. And it gives this picture of God as this one who is great. This Ancient of Days gives the idea that God is great and is above and ruling over all things. And he's done so from all eternity. Well, what I like what we just sang this morning is this connecting thing, that this Ancient of Days, even though he is great in power and his authority rules over all things, that this is the God that is for us. Like, yes, he is great and he is powerful and he is mighty, but he is for us. So when we sing God is for us, it's the Ancient of Days that is for us. And when you put those two things together, that's a really incredible combination to think about and think about God in that way. That this God is so great, he's not distant from us. He says, no, I'm for you in my greatness. 
And I hope that what that does is that that will help just lift our hearts to praise him. We're going to sing now, oh, praise the name. That thinking about that this is God, the ancient of days, that he is for us, that this should result in just praising his great name. So let's continue to sing now, oh, praise the name. my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still.
greatness you sent Jesus Christ on our behalf and do this great work on the cross and the resurrection on our behalf so that God is no longer against us but is for us and we've been brought into right relationship with you to know you and so that we can glorify you and praise you and so we thank you for that Lord I pray that you be with us now as we now enter into into a time of digging into your word I pray that your word would do a work. We know that your word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. So we ask that it would, it would do a great work in our hearts and our lives. Pray that you be with Ryan as he brings the word. You'd fill him with your spirit. I pray that you be with us, that you would fill us with your spirit too, because we want to hear from you. We want to be changed by your word. We know that your word has this power. So we are now humbly asking that you would do a great work here this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. You may be seated. Hi, good morning. Glad to have you here with us this morning. If you are a guest, welcome. 
We're glad you're here. Wherever you are on your spiritual journey, we're glad you're here with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 4. If you're new with us or if it's been a while, we are making our way through a series on the book of Acts. We'd like to take books of the Bible here and preach to them verse by verse. The reason we do that is we want the Word of God to set the agenda. We really do believe, the, believe that the Bible is the Word of God. And as much as possible, we want the Word of God to set the pace for us. So, that said, let me pray and ask that God would bless us in our time together. Father, we do ask for your prayer, or ask for your kindness to us now to be displayed in that as we open your word, we would hear your voice clearly. There's always a lot going on. If we turn on the news, or if we just look into our own hearts, we realize that there are a million distractions. But Lord, we pray that you would get us focused this morning to hear from your word, to be encouraged and challenged and convicted and ultimately to see the greatness of your son, Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that you would be merciful to us this morning, sinners, and that you'd speak to us loudly and clearly through your word. I pray that you'd be merciful to me, a sinner, and that I would be able to preach in a way that's honoring to you and brings glory to your name. Father, please speak through your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to do something a little bit different this morning, and I want to invite you to go on a journey with me. In this case, a journey into the future, to imagine the world as it might be. So the year is 2031, just 10 short years from now, or 10 really long years from now, depending upon how you look at it. Either way, it's 2031, and a lot has changed in the United States. Now, not all the changes are bad. Recent medical breakthroughs have all but eliminated certain types of cancer. That's good. You'll be happy to know that the Cornhusker football team just won their sixth national championship. I know it's hard to believe. It's hard to believe, but they did it. Their first since 1997. So there are some good things happening in 2031, but there's some concerning things happening too. Two more presidential elections have come and gone. And sadly, those two elections made the 2016 and 2020 elections seem tame in comparison. The country is more divided than ever, which seems nearly impossible to believe, given back that in 2021 we thought it was divided. Civil war, which once seemed like a distant impossibility, now feels like it almost might be inevitable. But as troublesome as the political state of the country is, the moral landscape of the United States in 2031 is far more troubling. It's not just that the country has largely abandoned biblical norms for morality. That happened a long time ago. It's that many in the country now have actually gone so far as to label some teachings of the Bible as dangerous and hateful, and even unfit for public consumption. In fact, more than half of the states in the United States have now banned the printing of the Bible. Even those states that have not yet banned the printing of the Bible have put prohibitions on teaching certain parts of the Bible. And it's in that context that Fremont E. Free, still standing in 2031, by the way, recently ran into some trouble. Not surprisingly, given its history, Fremont E. Free kept preaching the Word of God despite the new laws and despite the warnings from the government. And just this last week, right in the middle of October 2031, a few of the pastors and several Sunday school teachers were arrested because they were preaching what the Word of God says. Now, if I told you the names of those arrested, you'd probably recognize some of them. Several of them have been members for decades. Others are actually people that grew up at the church back in the early 2010s or 2020s, and they came back to the church to teach. So you would recognize the names if I told you, but the names aren't important. What is important, though, is this. They were thrown in jail last week and threatened with more serious punishment because they are preaching the word of God. And given rumors of what's happened to other Christians around the country, there's good reason to believe that these threats are not idle. There's even been talk recently of Christians in California being killed because they simply read what the Bible says. Things haven't gotten that bad in Nebraska yet, but there are ominous signs that things might be headed that way. And that's what makes the upcoming release of these prisoners from Free Money Free kind of bittersweet. Those jailed are scheduled to be released later this week. And obviously there's a relief that the teachers are being set free, but there's also great trepidation because it's almost certain the tougher days are ahead, and maybe even soon. The church has actually called for a meeting immediately after the release of the prisoners, but you're not even sure if you should go. It seems highly possible that if you go, you might find yourself in trouble. Maybe you'll be in jail. Maybe worse. And if that happens, you wonder, what will happen to your family? What might happen to your kids? So what will you do? That's the question. Will you call a lawyer to find out what legal trouble you might get into? Will you run and hide? Will you deny that you've ever been a part of free money free? Will you abandon the faith altogether? Or will you take a different tactic and will you double down? What will you do? How will you respond to this crisis? Now, having asked that question, I want to bring us back to the present time, 2021. 
I'll be the first to admit my 2031 scenario could be far-fetched, although there's a big part of me that wonders if it's not as far-fetched as it seems, given the current trajectory that we're on. But far-fetched or not, what does seem certain is that barring a revival, and by the way, revival is possible. God could do that. He could work in such a way that there would be many in our country who would repent of their sins and trust Christ, and I pray that he does. But barring a revival, it seems certain that things will get more difficult for Christians in the next 10 years. And I think it's worth asking this question this morning. In fact, the whole reason I go through this 2031 exercise is to ask this. How will you respond when things get difficult? My hope is that we'll respond a lot like the church in Acts 4. In Acts chapter 4, the early church encounters a scenario that is not all that different than the 2031 scenario I just laid out. In fact, you can make the argument, and I think it'd be a pretty easy one to make, that the circumstances that the church faces in Acts 4 are actually far more grim than the imaginary ones I just painted from 2031. I think the way that the church responds in Acts 4 gives us a blueprint for how we might respond to persecution should it ever come our way. For that matter, I think there's some things that the church does in Acts 4 that should serve not only as a model for how we respond to persecution, but they also serve as a model for how we should respond to any crisis. So listen, I'll just say this. I hope that my imaginary 2031 scenario never comes to pass. But if it does, or even if the difficulties come to a lesser degree, I hope that Acts 4 serves as our blueprint going forward. Because in Acts 4, I think the church demonstrates for us exactly how we respond to crisis and how we should respond to persecution. Now, having said that, before we get to the passage, I think it's probably helpful for you to know a little bit of background here in case you weren't with us last week. As you may remember from our passage last week, Peter and John, two of the most important leaders in the church, have been arrested. And they've been charged not to speak at all in the name of Jesus. And yet, Peter and John are not deterred by this at all. In fact, they say, listen, you can tell us not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus, but we can't help but speak of what we've seen in her. We are going to keep speaking his name. And so the religious leaders and the officials, obviously they're troubled that Peter and John would respond this way, but because they're afraid of the crowds, they let Peter and John go anyway. And that's where we pick up the story in Acts 4, verses 23 to 31. So Peter and John have been arrested, told not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. They say, we're going to do it anyway. The religious leaders and officials reluctantly let them go. So we pick up the story in Acts 4, 23 to 31. I'm going to ask you to stand here out of reverence for the reading of God's word. Acts 4, verses 23 to 31. The words should be on the screen here shortly. You can follow along as I read. You can look along in your own Bibles or on your phones. Acts 4, 23 to 31. The word of God says this. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, excuse me, and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It's the word of God you may be seated. So in this passage, Acts 4, 23 to 31, we essentially have the inside scoop as to how the early church responds to their 2031 moment. The leaders have been arrested, now released, and no doubt the danger for the church is still very real. Were we to be in their situation, I suspect many of us would indeed lawyer up, or we would head for the hills, we would run in fear. But the early church responds, and I think what are some maybe unexpected and surprising ways. And again, in doing so, I think they provide the blueprint for us going forward as to how we manage crisis. What do you do when your world is falling apart? What do you do when the persecution is real? What do you do when your faith is being questioned? What do you do when your safety is no longer guaranteed? For the early church, the the answer was threefold. Pray immediately and fervently. Rest in the character of God. Keep clinging to and preaching 
the Word of God. That's the blueprint for responding to crisis, and specifically, it's the blueprint for responding to persecution. And my prayer is that if our 2031 moment ever arrives, that this is how we would respond. And to encourage you to that end, I just want to slow down here and help you see each of those three elements of the blueprint in this passage in Acts 4. So notice first that when the early church is threatened with persecution, their first response is to pray immediately and fervently. This is their first response, verses 23 and 24. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. So the church is faced with great difficulty. Their first response is to stop and pray. Now I'll admit, that my first response in times of crisis is typically not to stop and pray. Rather, my first response is typically to look inwardly and see if there's some way I can resolve the situation using my own resources, or it's to look outwardly and wonder, is there any person who can help me work through this particular issue? For example, years ago when we received news that our adoption process had been delayed, my first response was not to stop and pray, I'm sad to say, but rather my first response was, who do I need to call? Who do I need to get on the phone with, or who do I need to email to make this happen? Similarly, when our son was sick in the hospital, again, I'm sad to say my first response was probably not to stop and pray, but rather to call doctor friends that I knew, or to try to figure out what hospital do we need to go to. Or to use another example, when someone in the church is disgruntled, my first instinct, usually again, not to stop and pray. Rather, it's to think, okay, what conversation can I have to try to smooth the waters? But in Acts 4, when faced with a crisis of serious proportions, the church's first response is to stop and pray. And to be clear, the circumstances that they are in here is a crisis of serious proportions. Again, Peter and John have been released, and they go and tell their friends what's happened. And specifically, they let their friends know that the chief priests and elders have told them they can no longer speak in the name of Jesus. That's a pretty serious problem for the church. To tell Christians they can no longer speak in the name of Jesus is kind of like telling a doctor you can no longer practice medicine. Or it's like telling a farmer you can no longer plant crops or raise livestock. Or it's like telling a mechanic you can no longer fix things. Teaching and speaking in the name of Jesus is kind of essential to the mission of the Christian church. And when I say kind of essential, I mean essential. So for the early church to be threatened with punishment if they keep speaking in the name of Jesus is a crisis moment. And the church's first response in Acts 4 is to stop and pray. Now, given my tendencies, as I've already laid out, I think my first reaction would have been, who do I know in the Roman government that I can get a hold of? Or who do I know on the religious council that I can have a conversation with? Or I think I might have been tempted to think, what strategies can we begin to employ to go under the radar? Or I might have even been tempted to ask the question, is there any wisdom in relocating to a new area? Maybe maybe we could just go someplace where it's safer. But there's no hint that the early church does any of that. Instead, their first and immediate reaction is to stop and cry out to the sovereign Lord. And so my question for us this morning is this. Why is it that our first response, and maybe I'm alone in this, but I doubt it. Why is it that our first response is usually to look inward or outward rather than upward in times of trouble? Why is it that our first response is to do that when the, fir- when the early church's first response was to look up? I suspect the answer to that question is twofold. One, we tend to overestimate our own abilities. And two, we tend to underestimate God's abilities. One of the great challenges of living in the United States in 2021 is that we have a lot of resources at our disposal. If you lived in the first century in the Middle East, The idea that you could just network your way out of any trouble or you could resource yourself out of any problem would have been laughable. For that matter, if you're living in most countries in the world right now, the idea that you could just look inwardly and solve all your problems would be equally laughable. A person living in a corrupt country with limited resources, which is most of the countries throughout the history of the world, you can't just make your problems go away by looking inwardly or outwardly. But in the United States, if we're honest, we oftentimes can. We have enough resources and enough connections and enough money that we can usually get ourselves out of most situations. There are very few times where we feel totally helpless. 
it always feels like there's another card that we can play. And oftentimes there is. But therein actually lies the danger. Because we have resources, and because we have connections, and because we have money, we've fallen in the trap of thinking that we're more powerful than we actually are. And thus, we fall into the habit of looking more inward and outward rather than upward. A church member here once told me a story about a mission trip they'd taken to the Ukraine. On this particular mission trip, the church member was conversing with a Christian brother from the Ukraine. This Ukrainian believer obviously lived in much more difficult circumstances than ours. Less money, less resources, less opportunities, less safety. And yet, this Ukrainian Christian told this member from our church that he actually feels really sorry and concerned for Christians in the United States. And the reason he felt sorry and concerned is because American Christians don't have to rely on God in the same way the believers around the world do. And you know what? I think that Ukrainian brother was probably right. We don't have to rely on God in the same way that other people do. And that is dangerous. And it's dangerous because in having all the resources that we do, we end up overestimating our own abilities. But here's the truth. All of us, every person in this room, regardless of your income level, regardless of how many connections you have, you are a lot more vulnerable than you know. The idea that we're masters and commanders of our own fate is simply not true. For all of us, again, regardless of your status in life, it's entirely possible that in the next five minutes, your lives could be turned upside down. If you were to get a call from the doctor's office, a dramatical medical event, stroke, heart attack, the economy could completely, could, could completely collapse, the death of a loved one, a life-altering decision by a loved one, all of those things and many more circumstances could completely change your life like this. And all of that would remind us we're not as powerful as we think we are. Living in the United States in 2021 breeds a false sense of security, a false sense of self-importance. I think that's one of the reasons why our tendency is not to look upward when times, come, times of trouble come, but rather to look inward and outward. But I think the other reason we tend to look inward is because we tend to underestimate God's power and ability. And that brings us to the second piece of the blueprint in Acts 4. Not only did the early church respond to persecution with immediate and fervent prayer, but notice secondly that they rested in the character of God. Now no doubt, the fact that the early church prays first is instructive for us. But it's not just that they prayed that's instructive for us, it's what they prayed that's instructive as well. Look at the first half of the prayer in verses 24 through 28. Verse 24. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now the way in which the early church first addresses God sets the tone for the rest of the passage. They address him here as sovereign Lord. He is sovereign in the control of all things. He is Lord. He's powerful. There's no one like him. What's interesting about this is the early church was under threat of great persecution. They were under threat of great danger. And yet, there's zero question for them as to who is in charge. It's not the authorities. It's not the religious councils. It's not the crowds. It is God. The one who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. The king who is over all things and directs all things. The sovereign Lord, he is in charge. Now, I know for some people, the idea that God is sovereign over everything is discouraging. In fact, I read a quote earlier this week. Someone sent it to me that talks about how the sovereignty of God for a non-believer seems frightening. After all, if God is sovereign, why does he allow bad things to happen? If God is sovereign, then why doesn't he just put an end to evil? If God is sovereign, why are things so messed up? But while those are legitimate questions and questions worth asking, questions I think the Bible has some answers to, the fact of the matter is that for the early church, God's sovereignty 
in the midst of their difficulty was not discouraging, but rather it was a great comfort. The early church had a confidence that God was orchestrating everything for good, even in the midst of their difficulty. And part of the reason they believed that to be true, it would seem, is because they saw what had happened in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I think that's what's being alluded to in verses 25 through 28. In verses 25 and 26, the early church prays by quoting from Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, which Jim read earlier. It talks about the nations raging and the peoples plotting in vain. The kings of the earth and the rulers setting themselves up against the Lord's anointed. Now, just an interesting side note here. In verse 25, the church introduces Psalm 2, verses 1 and 2, by saying that Psalm 2 came through the mouth of David by the Holy Spirit. That's actually really valuable insight as to how Scripture comes about. Men wrote the Bible, in this case, David, but they wrote as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. And thus, we can legitimately say David is the author of Psalm 2, while at the same time saying Psalm 2 is authored by God. This is the way Scripture works. The men write, but they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now that aside, the early church saw Psalm 2, which was being inspired by the Holy Spirit, as being fulfilled in the death of Jesus Christ. In fact, look again at the argument of verses 27 and 28. Verse 27. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So the prophecy of Psalm 2, that there be nations and kings, rulers who would be against the Lord's anointed, was fulfilled in the early church's mind when Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel put Jesus to death. But notably, as verse 28 makes clear, the death of Jesus was exactly what God had planned, exactly what God had predestined. In other words, God was sovereignly carrying out his plan even when Jesus was put to death. And the implication of verse 28 is this. If God sovereignly directed the death of his son, then even the persecution of the church is under his good and sovereign plan too. And obviously for the early church, this was a comfort. It was comforting them for them to know that even in their midst of their difficulty, God was in control. And God's sovereignty should be a comfort to you too this morning. Hear this. If God is not in control of everything, then I'm not sure what hope we have in the face of difficulty. And I'm certainly not sure what hope we have about the future. Because if God's not in control now because someone or something is more powerful than him, then what would make us think he could ever get back in control? But the fact is, he is sovereign. He is in control. He is the sovereign Lord. And that is actually really good news. If God was good but not sovereign, our lot in life would be hopeless. Now, on the other hand, if God was sovereign but not good, that would be terrifying. To be under the hand of a wicked God who is sovereign would be terrible. But the overwhelming testimony of Scripture is that God is both. He is good and sovereign. And because both are true, we can rest in His character even when our world is falling apart. And we have to be honest, sometimes... Our world does fall apart. Sometimes people we love die. Sometimes the call from the doctor is bad news, and sometimes persecution is real. But as demonstrated by the death of his son, God has a plan. In fact, it's the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us confidence that God does have a plan no matter how bad things go. How do we know that God loves us when the loved one dies? Or how do we know that God is good when the doctor calls with bad news? Or how do we know that God is good when persecution is real? We know that God is good because he sent his son to die for our sins. And we know he's sovereign because he planned ahead of time this would happen. That's the point of quoting Psalm 2. And we know he's sovereign because he raised Jesus from the dead. So church, let me encourage you with this. If our time of persecution comes, if our 2031 moment arrives, follow the pattern of the early church and rest in the good and sovereign character of God. More than that, even as we face the trials of life now, apart from any future persecution, rest in his character today. He is good and he is in control. He can be trusted, so rest in him. That's the second piece of the blueprint from Acts 4, 23 to 31. The third is this, keep clinging to and keep preaching the word of God. So pray immediately and fervently, rest in the character of God, Keep clinging to and proclaiming the word of God. 
Now, it's important to keep in mind here that the early church was in trouble for what reason? They were in trouble because they were proclaiming the word of God. They were boldly and unapologetically proclaiming Christ. And this put them in the crosshairs of the authorities. So what do they pray for? They're in trouble because they're preaching the word of God. They pray that they would keep preaching the word of God. In fact, look at the latter half of the prayer here in verses 29 and 30. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Will you stretch out your hand to heal? And signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. So here's the thing. If I were a part of the church in Acts 4, I would probably pray for things like safety. God, please keep us safe from the authorities. Or I would pray for a change of mind from the authorities. God, please change their minds so they see things correctly. Or I might even pray for justice. God, rain down your justice on these wicked oppressors. But none of that happens here in Acts 4. Now, I recognize that they probably prayed for a really long time, and maybe they prayed for those things later. But at least as we have it here, as highlighted by the Holy Spirit, that's not the main focus of their prayers. Now, the early church does ask God to look upon their threats, but when they pray, they pray for boldness, to keep speaking the word of God. And they ask that God would stretch out his hand and perform signs and wonders so that the word of God might advance. They don't pray for safety. They don't pray for the authorities to change their minds. They don't pray for justice. They pray for boldness to proclaim the word of God. And they ask God to keep giving them signs so that the people would know the word of God is true. And God answers their prayer. Verse 31. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So we're led to believe here that as they're praying, the building shakes. Which, by the way, that would be pretty amazing. Right, if we were doing that on Sunday mornings, we were praying all of a sudden it started shaking, we think, okay, something's going on here. But not only does the building shake, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, which I don't think is a reference to a second Pentecost event here. The believers were filled with the indwelling Holy Spirit earlier in Acts 2. So the filling of the Holy Spirit here is simply, I think, a reference to the Holy Spirit now empowering them to speak boldly, which they do. The end of verse 31 tells us they continue to speak the word of God with all boldness, which is exactly what they prayed for in verse 29. In fact, if you compare verse 29 to verse 31, you see their prayer was answered almost exactly. Verse 29, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Verse 31, they continue to speak the word of God with boldness. So they prayed, God answered. And in both the prayer request and the answered prayer, we're reminded that if the word of God gets you in trouble, that should not discourage you or deter you from continuing to proclaim the word of God. Rather, counterintuitive as it may seem, you must keep clinging to the word of God, which the early church does in quoting Psalm 2, and you must keep proclaiming the word of God. And here's why. Salvation is found in no other name. And unless people hear about Jesus, they cannot be saved. Proclamation of the word of God may have been the very thing that landed the early church in trouble. But proclamation of the word of God was the only thing that could rescue a lost world. And so the early church prays, keep giving us boldness. And the thing you need to understand this morning is this. The world around us may be increasingly opposed to the word of God. And in particular, opposed to certain sections of what the Bible teaches. But that which the world despises is still the only thing that can rescue it. Because the word of God contains the message of Jesus Christ. Every word in this book points to Christ. And because salvation is only found in Christ. To reject the word of God then is to reject the word who became flesh and dwelt among us and died on the cross for our sins. So listen, it's possible that the world may end up hating us because we proclaim the word of God. But what other option do we have other than to keep proclaiming it anyway? Think about it this way. Let's say you are a person who despised swallowing pills. In fact, you refuse to swallow a pill no matter the circumstance. Regardless of how sick you were or what ailment you face, your opposition to pills is absolute. In fact, your aversion to pills is so serious and it's so well known, you are regularly posting on social media, I will not take pills. Everyone around you knows you hate pills. But then you get bitten by the most venomous snake in the world. And as it turns out, the only way to live is to take the anti-venom pill immediately. 
In that scenario, despite your hatred for pills, what other option would the doctor have other than to commend the pill to you? If the only way to live is by taking the pill, the doctor can't offer you other alternatives. Now, by the way, I know some of you are loophole people, so you're thinking, well, we could crush the pill, or we could liquefy it and give it a shot. Sorry, not in this analogy. The doctor can't say in this scenario, if the pill is the only option, the doctor cannot say to you then in good conscience, well, I guess we could just put a Band-Aid on. That might work. Or I guess we could just try to stitch it up. That might bring a cure. Or you know what? Let's just give it time and see how it goes. No, none of those options work. So regardless of how much you may hate pills, regardless of how much you may protest against them, if the pill is the only cure, then the only thing the doctor can do in good conscience is say, here it is. This is your only option to live. In the same way, no matter how much the world may hate what the Word of God says, and no matter how much the world may protest against certain things that the Word of God teaches, if proclaiming the Word and pointing to Christ is the only means by which people can be saved, then what other option do we have other than to say, here it is. Here it is. I don't think it's inconceivable that we're on the road to the Bible becoming a major point of contention in our society. And I'm not just talking about a generic point of contention like it is now. I'm talking about a legal point of contention. I'm talking about people being fined or jailed or blacklisted or losing their jobs simply because they believe what the Word of God says and they're not afraid to proclaim it. But listen, if that happens, the solution is not to hide our Bibles, to put them under a lamp. The solution is to keep proclaiming the Word. It may cost us in the short run, but in the long run, if we want our neighbors or coworkers or relatives or friends to know Christ and to experience the joy of being with Him forever, we must double down. And we must keep proclaiming the Word and say, here we are, we can do no other. Listen, the church in Acts 4 did not pray for safety. They prayed for boldness to keep speaking the Word. And if the time comes when we have our Acts 4 moment, I hope that we'll do the same. In fact, I hope we follow the entire blueprint of Acts 4. I hope that we respond to crisis or persecution by praying immediately and fervently, by resting in the character of God, and by clinging to and proclaiming the Word of God. Now, having said all that, there's one more thing I want you to see here in Acts 4. And that one more thing I want you to see is this. Notice that everything that happens in this passage, the church does together. Acts 4 is not a story of one individual standing their ground by themselves. It's a picture of the church standing together. The language of togetherness and community is everywhere in this passage. Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends. It doesn't say when they were released, they went home and cried. When they were released, they went to their friends. Verse 24, and when they heard it, they lifted their voices together. They didn't pray by themselves, they prayed together. Verse 29, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants. Notice plural, they're doing this together. Verse 31, and when they, again plural, had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together, there's that word again, together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Listen, I know we live in Nebraska. It's kind of a do-it-yourself state. We don't like asking for help. We don't like when people know that we're in a pinch. We like to handle things on our own. A lot of times that bleeds over, that mentality bleeds over to our spiritual lives. In fact, there are a lot of people, you probably even know some who say, well, yeah, I'm I'm a Christian, but I don't really need to go to church. I don't really need to be going and gathering with the people of God. For that matter, there are some who attend church. They say, well, yeah, I, I maybe should go to church, but I don't need to be deeply connected to the body of Christ. I can just come on Sunday morning, then leave, And no one needs to know me any better. But listen, while it's absolutely true, and hear this clearly, it's absolutely true that we are saved only by the work of Christ on the cross. Our church attendance, our church participation does not save us. That's absolutely true. At the same time, it's still true that the idea of living out our Christianity by ourselves, apart from the body of Christ, is an idea that is completely foreign to the New Testament. If you are serious at all about pursuing Jesus, and if you say you're a Christian, I hope you are, then you're going to need other people to help you do so. When the crisis of moment arrives in Acts 4, the church doesn't batten down the hatches and leave each man or woman to fend for him or herself. 
They come together. They pray together. They rest in God's character together. They proclaim the word of God together. And listen, if our 2031 moment ever arrives, we will need to do the same. Or for that matter, even if our 2031 moment never arrives, we'll still need to do the same. Because the truth is, Acts 4 is not just a blueprint for serious persecution. It's a blueprint for how we live for Christ in all of life. If we are going to stay the course and faithfully proclaim Christ, we're going to need to pray together and rest in the character of God together and keep clinging to and proclaiming the word of God together. So listen, I'm not a prophet. I have no idea what 2031 will look like. Maybe it'll look a lot like the imaginary scenario I painted. Maybe it'll be way better or way worse. I have no idea. But what I do know is this. If the day comes where trouble or persecution finds us, or even if that day doesn't come, the path laid out in Acts 4 is the path forward. Pray immediately and fervently. Rest in the character of God Keep clinging to and proclaiming the word of God and do all of it together. That's the blueprint. That's the way forward, even if our world falls apart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Acts 4 and the great reminder we have of how the early church responded to persecution. And Lord, I pray that you would prepare us now that if our moment of persecution comes, we would respond in the same way by praying immediately resting in your sovereignty and continuing to proclaim the word of God. Oh Lord, help us to do this. And even if persecution doesn't come, we pray that we would still do the same things. Oh Lord, help us to do this because we love you and we want to make much of you and we want to experience the joy of living in your body together and proclaiming you together and resting in you together. Lord, help us to do this for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, our benediction today is going to be from the book of Jude. It says this, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. You're dismissed. Have a great week.